Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, General. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I just want to reassure you on one score. Uh, I'm no PhD, no matter what the general just said. I only have three years of college, full disclosure here. Uh, but I, I realize it's been said several times tonight that I'm the first Marine to be honored with this award. And believe me, OSS Society, I understand the difficulty when you try to match intelligence and Marine in one sentence. <laughs> so I bear you no ill will, no rancor at all over the delay. But what does one say uh, after everything we've seen? I just saw a movie, I thought it was fascinating, and I didn't realize I was half that good. Um, I, w I was a, no false modesty, I was a pretty average Marine, but like some of us, I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, and we should never mistake what's due to your merit and what's due to just plain good fortune. Uh, I would just tell you too that I appreciate the OSS Society inviting me here tonight I don't get invited to speak in front of many polite organizations uh, anymore, you know, after some of the things I've said. And so uh, some of which have been repeated here. Among you, you take it in stride and you embrace it, but most places would have people vomiting into their napkins. You know? But I just tell you, so what do I say on a night like this? Uh, I was uh, told twice in emails today uh, not to shorten my remarks. So I brought the proper Fidel Castro length of three hours and 27 minutes. Uh, but General Hugo, I know your role and why I'm up here today. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you for this honor, <clears throat> this award that's given in the name of just an exemplary, an American fighting man, Wild Bill Donovan, so wise and cunning, admired. Uh, by everyone who ever served with him, people who didn't even like him, respected him, uh, and that's sometimes very, very important in the wild uh, days of Washington, D.C., then in his day and now. He also always did his best for the troops. If there's one thing that comes through all through his career from his active duty army time in World War I right on through, he was always doing his best. There are too many of my heroes here tonight for me to recognize all of you. Uh, I would just tell you that uh, I'm humbled to be among so many of you, uh, humbled and I would say grateful. Uh, those of you who've kept the faith, uh, and I would also say got me out of every jam I got you into. Uh, so, uh, but we'll save some of those stories for the bar. Uh, but all of us, and thank you for glamorizing alcohol tonight. Uh, when I, say, uh, I understand that. It's, appreciated that all of us here tonight are bound together we come from across the land and we come from our allies and we all know in this room I can speak for every American in the room of the great respect and the absolute devotion we have to our allies that America goes through raucous times but keep the faith with us as the British Prime Minister put it once we uh, once we have exhausted all possible alternatives we'll do the right thing <clears throat> but we're bound together by our dedication to the survival of our nation, of this radical experiment in democracy that you and I call America, this government of the people and by the people and for the people with all of its, like I said, very raucous ways. I think, too, that uh, I've known some of you for so long, uh, Lady John, some of the people here, that we actually have pictures of each other when we had different color hair. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> Uh, those pictures come from the Western Pacific, from Central America, from East and West Africa, from Baluchistan before Afghanistan was cool. goes back a long time. But I would just tell you, too, that I have seen, as I had the great good fortune to serve alongside Special Forces many times. I was never, by the way, a Special Operator. I want to make that clear. I was just a standard run-of-the-mill Marine Infantry guy, but I saw enough of you to know that the descendants of Wild Bill Donovan uh, are absolutely true to his image, to his standards, to his character. And I think we always knew when we were around you that when danger loomed, you'd be there. It's as simple as that. When there was trouble, you would be there, that you had the right stuff, you had the courage and the competence to make a difference wherever you landed and the enemy was going to pay. It was just a matter of when did we meet them. And I said earlier 
that I was humbled because when I look across this room tonight, and I knew what I was going to see because I've known so many of you, what is front and center is not me standing up here right now, it's the trust that's throughout this room. It's the shared trust that's front and center. It's the unspoken coin of the realm in this room. It's the precious glue that means we'll hold the line as the storm clouds gather on the horizon, we will hold the line. I've witnessed your operators in, in uh, very tough times, very austere times in the field. I've observed their courage on the front lines and their constant valor, a given that so few nations can ever hope for in their forces. I've also witnessed with pride the intelligence community's leaders in the highest level conference rooms and felt pride in them that can only come from watching them too in action. Like the young patriots in the field, those leaders here in Washington tell it like it is. They tell it like it is no matter how unpalatable. They refuse to hide behind what some have characterized as a treacherous curtain of deference, refusing to change their assessments even when grimly unpopular, refusing to soften their position. So from the youngest operators in the field to the junior analysts to in our intelligence services to the most senior, I've seen all of you holding fast to your integrity and General Donovan, I know, would be proud. I was three years the commander of US Central Command. Three years, well, just short of that. I uh, left early under that president also. Uh, <laughs> I have a very nonpartisan way. I've reportedly been fired by presidents of both parties. <laughs> Actually, I beat one of them to the draw. But three years as, an, as a four-star commander, and I would ask the historians in the room if they have, know of any other general in history before me who was not surprised once by an operational matter. How many generals in history can say that? I don't know of many, and I've read about quite a few of them as I tried to learn from their mistakes. I owe that record that I was not surprised to people in this room, to many of you in this room, many of whom I will never know by name. I would tell you, too, that over decades I've heard these breathless accounts of in alleged intel failures. And once in a while, yeah, we have an intel failure. So what? Last perfect guy died on a cross a long time ago. Get over it, you know? <laughs> But what I also find, but ladies and gentlemen, what I also find is most of those who claim intel failures, they're alleged by people who contract out their thinking on a host of issues. And it's hard to do that and be a leader. You can't contract out your thinking. And I think there are also people who need to clean the wax out of their ears and listen better when told what they refuse to hear on too many occasions. I was a very critical user of your intelligence. I know how to argue with an intelligence officer, not to argue them off their position, to make certain they've considered mine. <clears throat> but I can also tell you that when I got a position from an intel group that they would not change and I disagreed with, I would highlight it and send it, in my case as a four star, <clears throat> send it to the Secretary of Defense. I specifically wanted them to see what I disagreed with because I never had that level of arrogance that the young NCOs and petty officers in the Navy and the Marine Corps basically removed from a second lieutenant in the infantry long ago. <clears throat> so it was your blood, uh, sweat, and tears, or some combination or one of those that many of you in this room paid so that I would have that education and that advantage. But all that also comes to gratitude. It's not just humility I stand here with, it's gratitude, it's a depth of gratitude that I am not articulate enough to explain. That attitude for those of you who kept the faith when some tried to make political hay out of your activities. And I say thank you from one Marine who doesn't forget his debts ever. Thank you for not losing faith in our democracy because loyalty matters most when there are 100 reasons to not be loyal and you have stood the harshest of tests. The loss of comrades and the questioning of fools without losing your faith in your leadership or the mission. No summer soldiers here. These were the kind who went through Valley Forge and marched out disciplined to humble the Redcoats 
who would defeat Napoleon a few years later. And if you look at what we know about character development, we are not defined simply by going through tough times. We're defined by how we respond to tough times. What do we do when the tough times hit? And there, nobody can look at the reputation that you have earned and not say that you have set the example for all of the armed forces. And that example has helped raise all the armed forces' views of their own capabilities because of your example right in front of them. You're the role models. I can say I'm humbled tonight to again be alongside you, my admired countrymen and women. And I will remain your fondest advocate. And I will never stop telling people what I know of your great courage. And no matter what you may read or hear said on television by some who are refugees from responsibility, the American people know in their hearts they can trust you because you carry on. You carry on in the finest tradition of William J. Donovan's lifetime of service and in the tradition of the OSS that he bred. There's going to be a museum built. We're going to build that museum. And that museum is going to stand as a collection of the stories of the human beings who wrote their stories in blood, sweat, and tears. But it's also because, as a Greek poet said a couple thousand years ago, left unsung, the noblest deed will die. And we need these stories to stay alive because tough times are coming for our nation and for all the democracies. We're going to have to get back together, and we will. But we will need someone at the tip of the spear when we do. And to all the veterans here, every one of you, no matter what you did and where you served, no matter if you served your whole time as an analyst here or you were on the bloodiest battles, we owe you a debt. I remember one night we were getting ready to uh, attack a town. It was Fallujah. <clears throat> and I went down to see the assault troops. And it was time about midnight for generals to get out of the way and turn it over to the young men. So with my half dozen radio operators, I started walking back to my vehicles a mile away. It's after midnight, and I stopped behind one of our lines, one of our assault units that would clear the enemy outpost before dawn so the assault battalions could move into the city. And the enemy had created some mischief, so we got down not to attract attention. I checked in with the corporal. And he said he'd take care of it, and they did. They took care of it. Things died down, just laying there, waiting until we were sure that it was over. And one of the young Marines, not realizing we'd not yet moved on, asked his corporal, he said, Corporal, do you think Fallujah will be tough in the morning? And we've got the beautiful ladies here who remind us why we fight, so I won't give it in quite the, quite the quotation from the corporal. But he basically said, hush and get some sleep. We took Iwo Jima, Fallujah won't be nothing. <laughs> and so when you hear, when you think of that museum that's going to show the tough time to what the OSS did in World War II and what you did in the current wars, we will pass on, just like the soldiers at Shiloh, the Marines at Bella Wood, the airmen at Ploesti, the Coast Guard at Guadalcanal, the army, the army, and the army, and how many battles where they've paid the most blood. And we are going to pass on those lessons because those lessons of the veterans, as they filter down to our young folks on the front line, <clears throat> those lessons remind them that we will ask nothing of them that other patriots have not already done, and yet they can do it. That'll send a lesson of confidence down to them, and no speeches by generals or secretaries of defense will ever take the place of your raw example of courage. Now, I'm from out west, that I'm confident that I can speak for the overwhelming majority of your fellow citizens and allies when I say thank you for riding for the brand. Thank you for looking beyond the hot political rhetoric of the day and rallying to the flag, signing that blank check that every one of you signed, payable with your lives for the protection of our experiment. Thank you for demonstrating America's awesome determination to defend herself. And you know, we're all thanked nowadays by people for our service. How many times have we heard it? You know, we're in uniform, we stop by a store, somebody realizes because we have short hair, we have a certain color of bag over our shoulder, they thank us. I appreciate it. That's great. 
but a corporal, like I get most of my good knowledge from petty officers and NCOs, a corporal told me what to say back. I'm always a little uncomfortable when they thank me because I feel sorry for anybody who doesn't get to do what we do. You know, it's just the way it is. And he said, just tell them they're worth it. He said, turn it around on them. And I would tell you that in a country with the problems that we face today, for you, the tip of the spear, perhaps you could consider responding that way, and it will spread quickly by your example, because we are holding you in such high esteem. But to start telling, telling every man, woman, and child, American citizen, or someone just visiting our country, every one of them that thanks us, let's start telling them you're worth it. Let's remind them of the dignity of the military, the dignity of danger that bonds us together. And let's make sure that we pass on that this great big experiment has not yet seen its best day. We're going to create its best days ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm grateful.